Good morning. One of the highlights of my week is a study group I belong to. The clergy at All Saints meet together to discuss the lectionary for the upcoming week, particularly the gospel. Prior to meeting, we have books that we are reading and sometimes do additional research or exegesis if you want a technical term. This past week, we spent time with the hymn in Paul's letter to the Philippians that Jane just read, particularly verse 7, where it says, Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. What does it mean to make one nothing? The Greek word for this is kenosis, which means emptying. Jesus emptied himself. This theme of emptying also came up with us the week before. And I would like to take some time to think about what that means for us today in the light of the gospel passage narrative that we just heard. Before I get into that, I want to think about how we approach this. In our desire to follow Jesus' teachings, we sometimes try to make difficult things seem more palatable. For example, if you forgive, you will feel better. Um, you'll set yourself free. Um, if you give away, you will receive. When you give something up for Lent, you will feel healthier and happier. Now, while these things may be byproducts of our acts of obedience, if they are the motivating factor, we somehow miss the point and miss the opportunity to be with Jesus and like Jesus. It flies in the face of kenosis. Jesus made himself nothing. He emptied himself. Emptying ourselves is not an exercise in making ourselves feel good. Greg Clark, a member of our clergy group, said that in all the self-help methods we are bombarded with, he could hear people talking about kenosis therapy. Now, let's look at the gospel in the light of kenosis, or as Paul says in his hymn, with the mindset of Jesus, which is to make myself nothing or of no reputation to be humble, and to be obedient. When do our concerns for our reputation, for getting what we think we deserve, for justifying our wealth, for the need to be right, getting in the way of our walk with Christ? We can contrast how the way of our world tends to be with the way of Jesus when we examine this gospel or Mark's passion narrative. Right at the beginning of our reading, there is dis a display of self-righteous indignation. Why was the ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. I would never be like that. I know better than that. My way is right. Your way is wrong. And I'm going to moralize about it. We then hear about Judas. Judas was frustrated. Jesus wasn't looking or acting like a Messiah. Getting on the good side of the high priests sounded like a good idea. Receiving financial gain was certainly attractive. And again, it seemed easy to moralize because Jesus did not fit the idea of a leader, let alone a Messiah. It was a win-win. Getting good with the high priests for personal gain with justification that this was somehow the high ground. The other disciples don't come out well in this story either. Jesus rightly predicts that they will desert and scatter when things become tough, even Peter, especially Peter. Again, self-preservation in our worldly terms seems easily rationalized. Even before the scattering, the disciples give in to personal needs and fall asleep, missing the opportunity to be with Jesus in this hour of need three times, interestingly enough. Concerned with creature comforts, they are not alert to the moment at hand. The moment of Judas' betrayal is a terrible one. In his selfish, self-centered act, Judas betrays the one who loves him, the one who chose him. This is not an impersonal act. It's not, this is not personal, it's just business. Rather, it is extremely personal. It is betrayal of the worst kind. He addresses him as rabbi. He kisses him. What should be familiar loving acts are used to destroy. 
Now in court, there are the false accusations and testimonies. With an, end, with the, an attitude of the end justifying the means, stories are twisted and used against Jesus. Again, with self-righteous indignation, People get swept up in the crowd for a false sense of belonging, a false sense of justice, a false sense of being right, bringing out the worst, crucifying, mocking, I'm right, you're wrong. In the end, the method of execution is significant. Now we can see the cruelty of the cross. People of that time understood that crucifixions were in, for insurrectionists, rebels, It was an act of elimination, extermination, rather than just a method of public example. In this passion narrative, how does Jesus differ? How does he empty himself and become a slave to the will of God? Jesus, silent against false testimony, did not enter into the rabble. He did not become just another voice in the crowd. But when he was asked who he was, he was clear. Yes, he was the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And then he went on to say, You will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with clouds of heaven. He stated it, and that was the end of it. It was the end of him. He did not candy coat things or ingratiate himself with the high priests for the sake of self-preservation. His phrase, You say so, was the closest he got to arguing with them. He knew who he was. God knew who he was. He did not waste his breath on those who were bound and determined to have him destroyed. No matter what they said, he did not join his accusers. As Paul states in Philippians, he took on the likeness of a human. That meant he understood fear, suffering, loneliness, and abandonment. Hence, the prayer to have this cup taken away. The hurt felt when Judas betrayed him, when his friends abandoned him, when Peter didn't stand up for him, when people unjustly turned against him. He even felt the utter abandonment of, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All these were experienced in the fullness of his humanity. Paul also states that Jesus assumed the role of a servant He was an obedient and loyal servant to the end. The needs of the master went above his feelings and needs. As we look at the behavior of people in contrast to Jesus, we can say that this is the way of the world. But in my job as parish health facilitator for the diocese, at times I see actions like we see here in our parishes and our diocese. Much, much worse, I see actions like this in myself. As Paul says in Romans 7, I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but I hate what I do. Thank God for the mercy of God. Even in this rather bleak reading, we hear of this mercy. Jesus says, But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And he does. And he will. He will go before us to Galilee. When we go, he will be there ahead of us, loving us, forgiving us, encouraging us, and calling us as disciples. Thank God for the mercy of God. When I was contemplating what it means to empty oneself, I tried to think about a historical Christian figure that had inspired me. For me, that person is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a German Lutheran theologian and prolific writer. He was incredibly Christ-centered and constantly asked who Jesus Christ was for him in that moment. In the years prior to the Second World War, he wrote about Christian community and ethics. One of his famous books is The Cost of Discipleship. I found a lot of his writing was prophetic. He was distraught when, for the sake of expedience with the Nazis, the church began to kowtow. He formed his own church, which he called the Confessing Church. In the end, he felt it let him down as well. 
He felt the church was more concerned with saving itself than with saving humanity. When seeing the atrocities that were being committed, he made the difficult decision to become part of the resistance movement, including plotting for the demise of Hitler and the party. He ended up in prison. He didn't really have to do this. He was of good social standing. He was well-educated and of the Aryan race. He could have kept his head down and waited things out, justifying that this would be a better big picture goal. But his conscience would not allow him to do so. Christ in the moment wouldn't allow it. I believe some of his most profound writing came from his time in prison. He said, it is not the religious act that makes the Christian, but the participation in the sufferings of God in the secular life. Although his life was reduced to that of a German prison, he continued to reflect on the life of a Christian as opposed, as opposed to worldliness. Just what I've been talking about. Of course, he put it much better than I ever could. This is what he said. By this worldliness, I mean living unreservedly in life's duties, problems, successes and failures, experiences and perplexities. In so doing, we throw ourselves completely into the arms of God, taking seriously not our own sufferings, but those of God in the world, watching with Christ in Gethsemane. That, I think, is faith. That is metanoia. And by metanoia, he means transformative change of heart. And that is how one becomes a human and a Christian. End of quote. While in prison, he suffered fear, deprivation, and nightmares. At one point, he was quite ill. But here is something one of his fellow prisoners said about him. He always cheered me up and comforted me. He never tired of repeating that the only fight which is lost is that which we give up. Many little notes he slipped into my hands on which he had written biblical words of comfort. Bonhoeffer never gave up his calling as a pastor. He led worship and sang hymns. He did not lose his optimism, and in one of his writings he reflected on it. There are people who regard optimism as frivolous, and some Christians think it impious for anyone to hope and prepare for a better earthly future. They think that the meaning of present events is chaos, disorder, and catastrophe. And in resignation or pious escapism, they surrender all responsibility for reconstruction and for future generations. It may be that the day of judgment will dawn tomorrow. In that case, we shall gladly stop working for a better future, but not before. Bonhoeffer was executed just days before the end of the war. The method of execution was to make an example of him. Rather than a firing squad, he was hung. His last words were, This is the end. For me, the beginning of life. Over the years, Bonhoeffer has challenged me in ways that are sometimes quite uncomfortable, but he has also encouraged me. Can we ask ourselves, who is Christ in this moment? Who is Jesus Christ for us today? And then, how do we act on that? individually and collectively? How do we empty ourselves, regard ourselves as nothing? I was thinking about this in the context of the body of Christ. Who or what is Christ asking of us? With our mouths, are we being asked to speak up? Are we being asked to shut up? Are we afraid to speak truth? Are we too concerned for our own voice to be heard? With our eyes, what is Christ pointing out to us? What does Christ want us to see? Can we see with the eyes of Christ? With our ears, can we hear what Christ is saying? Can we hear the cries of the poor? Or are our own needs and wants overpowering those cries? How does Christ want to use our hands and feet? Where are we being called to action? Where are we being called to silence? Where is Christ leading us? Can we follow him to Galilee, or are we too concerned with following the crowd? 
with our hearts can we go away and pray with Christ, or do our creature comforts distract? Now, I spoke of Bonhoeffer, but I also thought of some shining examples in my church communities. And you know these people. They are optimistic and positive. They build up rather than tear down. They don't get caught up in gossip and bad-mouthing. They are involved in acts of generosity and kindness in the parish and the community beyond. You leave them feeling better about yourself and the world. They work tirelessly for others. They are prayerful and humble and don't seek recognition or accolades. They are ambassadors for Christ and aren't afraid to admit it or share it. Let's spend more time with them. Let's be more like them. We now enter the walk of Holy Week. It is the holiest of holies when we contemplate what our Lord did for us and attempt to walk with him in the cross and passion of his redemptive love. I pray that this is a time of transformation for us all, that we may emerge to joyfully join together in our Easter hallelujahs. Amen.